Kristen Atchison here, and we're still in chapter nine. We are on our second video lecture talking about the ear. Um, so the ear is really broken down into kind of three pieces. The outer ear, and this is the part that you see. When you think of your ear, um, you're thinking about your outer ear. Um, the middle ear is where this information is kind of amplified. Um, and this is not this is not your ear canal where you get wax. This is not what you're using a Q-tip to clean. Um, that's still part of your outer ear. Your middle ear is on the other side of your eardrum. And then your inner ear um, is where those sound waves are being transduced into the neural messages. So just like we transduced that light information um, into, ne into neural signals, what's happening here is we're taking that sound information and transducing it into neural signals. And that's happening inside the inner ear. To the outer ear, we have the pina, which is the, the cartilage piece on the both sides of your ears. And really the main focus of this is it's collecting sound. Um, you know, you see those old cartoons where someone um, that couldn't hear, they got, you know, one of those big cone shaped things to be able to hear better. Um, they were trying to collect more sound so they could amplify that and they could hear better. Um, so your pina is just doing that. Uh, the auditory canal um, is where the sound travels to reach the eardrum. The eardrum is this tightly stretched membrane that vibrates when the sound hits it. So just as a drum vibrates when you hit it, um, that's what's happening with the eardrum. It's a tightly, straight membra tightly stretched membrane in that same analogous way. Then we have the ossicles, and these are actually the smallest bones in your body. So for trivia night sometime, um, they're typically called, um, the kind of colloquial terms are the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, and I'll talk about their more scientific names in just a minute. And what they do is they really amplify the sound, okay? So they take the information from the eardrum that's amplifying it, um, and they're going to amplify it further um, with the, this joint in your body. Um, and it passes that information along to the cochlea in the inner ear um, through this oval window. The cochlea is in the inner ear, okay? Um, and this is, it's this thing that's shaped like a snail here. Um, and this is where those sound waves are transduced into neural impulses, where you can see the auditory nerve is connected here. Um, that's because this is where between the, the information coming into the cochlea, when it leaves the cochlea, it's turned into a neural signal. Um, specifically, uh, the organ of corti is what's doing it inside of the cochlea, um, but the, it is inside the cochlea that the, that the magic is happening. Um, and then we also have the semicircular canals, um, which help with um, balance um, and orienting and orientation. Um, so I assigned a video for you guys to watch a crash course video. Um, really, I'm only concerned with you watching about the first seven and a half minutes of it. After that, it starts talking about these semi, semi, semicircular canals and about um, um, equilibrium. Well, it's super interesting and um, that's not where we're at yet. So um, you can really just watch those first seven minutes. It does a really good job of kind of further delving into this um, and showing you um, the kind of pieces of anatomy and how they're related. Um, and again, once we get that information into the neural, into the auditory nerve, that sends it to the brain, it goes to the thalamus and the auditory cortex and then into the temporal lobe. Um, we'll talk about that um, more in the subsequent chapters. An important thing to point out um, is that sound is being um, trans, um, is going through air Remember, it's the, um, the disruption of air molecules um, before um, it gets to the eardrum, okay? This is air. Um, and what the ossicles are doing is amplifying this information because it has to go into fluid in the cochlea. So the cochlea has fluid. If you've ever gone swimming, you know that when you try and talk underwater or try to hear a sound underwater, it's a lot harder to hear. Um, so this amplification that's happening with the ossicles um, is allowing us to kind of maintain a kind of le same level of sound um, between the air and the fluid. So what information is being lost um, in going from air to fluid is being made up um, through these ossicles. So um, I, when I was in graduate school, I um, went to the University of Texas at Dallas, which is home of the Callier Center, which is a huge, famous kind of um, world-renowned place for communication disorders, deafness, cochlear implant, 
um, things like that. Um, and so I have a ton of friends who are audiologists and speech language pathologists and all these different things. And so things like this, um, cartoons like this pop up on my social media feeds, but I love it. And I think it's, it's wonderful um, for this class. Um, so I'm sharing with you. So this is the stapes, the tiniest whittle bone in your body located in your middle ear. The sound waves entering your ear canal vibrate the malus, which is the first bone, the incus, which is the second bone, um, and then me, the stapes. So again, these are going to be those more um, the scientific um, terms, the technical terms for these three bones. And then I stomp on the oval window and send the signal to the ignorant ear. I am the powerful stapes. Your audio perceptions are at my mercy. Tee hee. So, um, again, that amplification is happening with these three bones, okay? Uh, the eardrum pushes um, the malus, then the incus, then the stapes, and then the stapes um, stomps on that oval window on the cochlea um, that then takes that, uh, amplifies that sound um, and sends it into the cochlea. So, hopefully you enjoyed that as much as I did. I just think it's funny. Um, anytime you have fire shooting out of the eyes of a theoretical bone, I think that's cause for humor. Okay, so sound amplification. Um, again, there's these two characteristics that are really helping for that. Um, the tympanic membrane concentrates that sound. Um, so again, that... Um, that eardrum being larger um, can concentrate that sound into that um, smaller area and effectively amplify um, its effect. Um, and then those ossicles, again, that lever um, magnifies the vibrations of that tympanic membrane coming from your eardrum. It's magnifying that um, and then conveying it onto that oval window like we saw in the... Um, the uh, cartoon before. Um, so these two things together are working to make up um, almost completely for that 20 to 30 decibels of loudness that we're losing when we're going from the air of the ear canal um, to the fluid of the cochlea. Um, so again, it's able to make up that difference because of this sound amplification. So again, those ossicles are the malus, the incus, and the stapes. She's not as near as cute here as she is in the cartoon. And again, they act as a kind of a lever. Um, so the pressure from the tympanic membrane hits that malus, which then hits that joint at the incus, which then hits that joint at the stapes, and it further amplifies it and pushes that harder onto that oval window, which again is amplifying this because it's going to need to be louder um, to make, to go through this fluid that's inside the cochlea versus the air that was, um, that the sound was traveling through before. Because um, of this kind of amplification, we also have what's called the acoustic reflex. Um, and this is actually a, con a contraction of tiny muscles in the middle ear um, in response to high intensity sound. So this is one way that you're trying to protect um, essentially your cochlea. Um, and what it does is it actually kind of stops those ossicles um, from moving as much. It kind of slows them down so they can't really amplify it the way that they want to. Um, and this actually, again, is protecting the auditory system from these loud mo uh, motions. Um, so these two muscles work together um, to tighten the eardrum so that it's not going to move as much. Um, and then, um, and again, cannot press, make so that the stapes can't press as forcefully on the oval wall of the cochlea. We don't want it to kind of, you know, punch the cochlea. Um, so again, these muscles are contracting in a way um, that it kind of prevents that. Now, the problem with this is it can't do it with sudden noises. It can do it when, you know, there's really, you know, something that is loud, like you're at a loud concert. It can do that kind of reflex, but it's not going to do it with like if you're someplace and a firecracker goes off close to your ear. Um, it's not going to be able to do that against those sudden loud noises. Um, so again, that's why your um, ear protection is always a good thing. Um, one of my um, one of my friends is in a metal band, um, and he and his his wife and his kids were going to the concert, um, and we wanted to go and support him too. So me and my daughter went as well. Um, but it's a metal concert, right? Um, and so I probably should have also had auditory protection on, um, but we definitely had headphones on my daughter um, and the other kids too, so that they again and I did have earplugs in. Um, but so that again, I could still hear these things, but then I'm kind of in, 
slowing down those sound waves from getting to my tympanic membrane um, so that again I can protect um, the ear. Um, another part of the ear is the eustachian tubes. Um, you're familiar with this um, if you have allergies, if you've been on a plane, um, if you've gone up to high elevations. Um, these are the tubes that connect, connect your middle ear um, to the top part of the throat. So um, kind of when you have allergies and you have, you know, um, drainage into your ears, unfortunately, it's going through your eustachian tube. Um, and this is normally closed. Um, but it can be briefly opened by swallowing or yawning. And so again, when your ears need to be popped, um, that's why they tell you to swallow or to um, yawn. Why you're supposed to chew gum when you get on an airplane is because when you're chewing gum, you're producing more saliva and you're having to swallow that saliva. Um, and the swallowing is what's um, normalizing this pressure. Um, between the outside and the inside of the ear. Um, and it really needs to be balanced um, on both sides so we can hear clearly. Um, so this is again why the infants cry and because of this unequal air pressure is painful and they don't know that you can yawn or sm swallow. And that's why a lot of times infants will be um, nursed or bottle fed um, on an airplane. So on takeoff and landing so that they are swallowing and that will kind of reduce that. Sometimes they'll also give small children lollipops um, because it's the same thing as gum. It's, it's um, encouraging them to swallow more often, which is again, normalizing that pressure on both sides um, of the um, outer ear versus the middle ear. So back to the, the inner ear, the cochlea. Um, the cochlea is again this um, snail looking um, organ um, and it's within the temporal bone um, of the skull. So it's surrounded by bone um, and it, um, inside of it is the basilar membrane. Um, and this is the shape of it and the basilar membrane are reversed and we'll talk about that in a second. But again, um, your book talks a little bit about cochlear implants, which you're not required to read, but if you're interested, you're welcome to. Um, cochlear implants are essentially um, implanting um, something inside the cochlea um, so that it can transduce um, something that's not working well with the cochlea. It's not transducing this information into the auditory nerve. Um, and so what's happening with a cochlear implant is they're implanting um, something in there to do that transduction essentially for it so that it again can convert that into, um, can send a signals um, to the auditory nerve. So the basilar membrane is a lot of where the magic is happening um, inside the inner ear. Um, and this is a tapered membrane. So again, it's reversed. So the cochlea is going to be wider at the front. Um, the basilar membrane is going to be um, narrower um, and stiffer um, at the base versus the apex. So the apex is going to be kind of that inside part of the snail shell. On that, And it's again, there it's the the smallest on the cochlea, so they're reversed. So where it's wide at the, the opening of the cochlea and it's narrow at the inside of the cochlea, um, we're gonna see the reverse for the basilar membrane. Um, and what happens is these pressure waves through, through the fluid, right? The fluid is gonna move this thing. Um, so kind of think of it like, you know, a parachute, when you move a parachute, it's kind of like that, that pressure from your, your arm movement moves um, the parachute. Essentially, it's the same thing. When you do out a sheet that pressure moves on the sheet it's kind of the same way um, and but it does it to various degrees um, depending on this frequencies of the sound um, so ultimately it's going to reflect these frequencies what's interesting is that each location across this membrane is has a characteristic frequency um, that it most responds to um, and this will really work out when we talk about those neural responses in the next um, video. And it separates the frequencies from complex wave, much in the way the Fourier analysis does it um, of the original sound wave. So it breaks it up. So again, we're not hearing mostly just pure tones. We're hearing these complex um, tones. When you're listening to me speak, those are complex tones. And what's happening is your basal ear membrane is again separating that out in the same way that the Fourier analysis was doing that um, with a sound wave, your basilar membrane is doing that for you. So here are some examples, um, again, about the kind of differences in hertz. Um, again, um, it's widest at the apex, um, and that's where we're going to see kind of like the lower tones are going to be done, um, where the higher tones are going to be um, done at the base. 
And so you can see some of sort of those differences. Um, this moves, um, and there are cilia in your ear um, that basically it moves. It moves these cilia. Um, and these are in, um, inside the organ of corti. And this is within the cochlear duct um, and, and it extends along the, the length of this membrane, okay? Um, and so what it does is these, as these hairs move, this physical stimulation of these hairs moving, these cilia moving, and there's different shapes hairs that we're not going to talk about, but as these cilia move, um, these cells move, that, that physical displacement is what's transducing the sound into a neural, a neural, um, a neural signal. Okay. So again, we're not going to talk about, um, kind of the different kinds of cells and the, the neurotransmit, the chemicals released and all of that. Um, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to again, go surface on this. Um, so the cilia, um, inside this organ of core time, um, are what are moving um, that transduces this information. Um, so this is, again, the organ of corti is where auditory transduction is happening. I mean, you can see the organ of corti is this little thing here. Um, and your book has these images as well. Those little orange things are the cilia um, that are being moved along um, those membranes. The basilar membrane is the pink membrane under the organ of corti. Um, and again, it's moving those, um, which then is transducing information into that yellow auditory nerve. Okay, so this ends the anatomy of the ear. Again, make sure you watch that crash course video. Um, it does a very good job of explaining this as well. Thanks.